This is National Preparedness Month. The federal government, along with many other nations of the world, telling people these are days when you need to be prepared. We live in uncertain times. There's just no getting away from that. Don't want to be negative, but these are dangerous days. We face unprecedented threats and unusual, unusual dangers wherever we go. It's good to be prepared. But let me tell you, you can be prepared with a first aid kit, you can be prepared with a flashlight, you can be prepared with a camping stove, you can be prepared with water, and you can go down the list. But if your heart is not right with the living God, you are totally unprepared for everything. And so this morning, we are going to zero in once again on spiritual preparation and what God's Word has to say to us in these last days. We're going to be looking at a word that the Apostle Peter wrote toward the end of his life, powerful word, and it's a word that speaks in a very mighty way to each and every one of us. It also raises a series of questions for us, and that's where we're going to head this morning. We're going to take a look at this word, at what, what the Lord says here, and then we are going to ask a series of questions that I believe each and every one of us need to confront in our personal lives if we are going to be prepared. So if you would turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at verse 15, powerful word, Pastor Phil has already referred to it. Hear these words from the Apostle Peter. In fact, we've got them up on the screen. Why don't you read along with me? Shall we read together? But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Great words, aren't they? Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. It raises all sorts of questions. And so this morning, let's address those questions, each and every one of us. I'm going to speak them, but I would encourage you to answer the question for yourself in each occasion. We're going to look at the who's and the where's and the how's that these words engender. The first question is simply this. Why are you hopeful? Always be prepared, Peter says, to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the reason for the hope that you have. Why are you full of hope? What makes you hopeful? You notice I misspelled it intentionally. Want to be full, double L, of hope. What gives you hope in your life? See, over the years, I have spoken with thousands of people. I originally, as a pastor, served as an evangelism pastor. And my, one of my primary responsibilities was to train people to go into other people's homes and to share their faith. Over the years, I have truly spoken to thousands of people. And I've asked a question time and again. The question is, if you were to die today and suddenly find yourself standing before God and He were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to Him? I've heard fascinating answers over the years. I've heard answers from good church people who've said, well, I, I've always gone to church. I've heard answers that go like this, well, I, I live a good life. I've heard answers like this, well, I, I think he would, but I don't think anyone can know that for sure. I've heard answers that go like this, I don't have a prayer. But you know what? Every single one of us can have a certain hope. 
And that certain hope is not based on membership in an organization. It is not what is often called churchianity in America. It is all about knowing the living God and encountering his incredible love in Jesus Christ. You know, I was born in a household where my mom and dad were faithful church tenders. Both of them came from families where their moms were very active in church. Both of them came from families where their dads never darkened the door. Both of my grandmothers were actually church organists in the same congregation. But neither of my grandfathers ever went to church. The only time I can remember my grandfathers going to church was on the day they were buried. You look at that and you say, oh, but they were wonderful people. And they were. But in the last days and hours of my one grandfather's life, this man who had never darkened the door of a church from the time he was married came to know the love of God in Jesus Christ. And his last words were these, I am in Jesus' arms. And what he came to understand is what true hope is all about. Because you see, hope is not based on how good you've been or how religious you are or how much you know about the Bible or how often you have attended worship services. Hope is based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is the love of our amazing God who came down among us and in the person of Jesus Christ actually stretched out his arms and died for us. Hope is found in the one who willingly went to the cross and who has risen from the grave and is coming back again. Hope is all about a relationship with him. And when you know him and know his great love, he gives an assurance. And here it is. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes, anyone who trusts in me has already passed from death to life. Why are you hopeful It's because Jesus Christ died for you. It's because Jesus died for me. It's because the God who is the creator of all things and has stretched out the universe in a fashion beyond my ability to even start to comprehend, he loved me so much that he was willing to go the whole distance to buy me back from the power of sin and death and the devil. Why am I hopeful? It's because Jesus is alive. It's because he's my savior. It's because I believe and trust in him. It's because he has stepped into my life and broken in and given me hope that is based not on my accomplishments, but on his. And that is the heart of the issue. When we read in the Bible, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the hope that you have. It has to start with the hope. Here's what the Apostle Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Why do you have hope? Because by faith, we can be born again to a living hope. And so the first question that every human being needs to confront is simply this. Why am I hopeful? Why are you hopeful? 
Is your confidence found in the Lord Jesus? Have you given your life to him? Have you simply said, thank you, Jesus, for dying and rising for me, and I believe in you? That's where it begins. That's where a life of faith starts. That's where God breaks into a person's life. And before we even talk about sharing the reason for the hope that we have, we better know that we've got hope. But there's a second question that follows right on the heels of this one. It's the who question. Who is your Lord? I have a friend, a pastor friend, whose life was turned absolutely upside down when he was in college was turned upside down when a person asked him, do you believe in Jesus? And he said, at that time in his life, he had actually been confirmed. He was confirmed, by the way, as an unbeliever, <laughs> which reminds us that churchianity is not where it is. You know, you can have your name on a roll and it doesn't matter a bit if you don't know the living God. But this person asked him, do you believe in Jesus? And he just said, well, sure. You know, I mean, I belong to church. <laughs> and then the person asked him this question. Is he the Lord of your life? And my friend had to admit, that just wasn't the case. Because at that point in his life, the living God was not calling the shots. In fact, he was living for himself and having a good time doing it. But as he pondered those words and went back to his dorm, reflected on them, they just continued to speak to his heart. And finally, finally he fell to his knees and said, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Not just my Savior, but my Lord. What about you, in your life? Who is your Lord? It is so critical to answer that question, to reflect on that question, to respond to that question. Because our Lord Jesus desires not simply people who know that he exists, but people who say, I sign up and I will follow you wherever you lead me. Who is your Lord? There's a third question as we ponder Peter's words. As Peter writes and says, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the reason. And it leads to this question. What? What is your testimony? What is the testimony of your life how has God broken into your life? And how has that made a difference in your life? You see, it is one thing to tell the fundamental truths of the message of Jesus. That the living God somehow, some way, took on human flesh and lived among us. That he lived a perfect and sinless life. A life that you and I are unable to live in our power. That he willingly went to a cross and died for all humanity. The living God offering himself up for his own creation. That he rose from the grave. It is essential to articulate those truths. But it is also essential to say, and here is how it has impacted my life. Each of us have different testimonies, how God has broken in. Each of us have different testimonies as to how the Lord has drawn us to himself. Each of us have different testimonies as to how God has shown up in our lives at various times and in various ways. And those testimonies are so frequently used by God to touch the life of another. And I can still remember as a teenager when I read the New Testament for the first time in my life on my own. I read it, as some of you know, in response to a political argument. And I was going to prove to a pastor that Jesus would have supported my politics. 
At the time, I was planning to go to the Air Force Academy. I was going to be a fighter pilot. I had wanted to do that from the time I was a little boy. And then I started reading the New Testament to prove my political views. And all of a sudden, I encountered a God who had different ideas. And it wasn't about politics. It was about who was going to control my life and who He is and what He has done. And I vividly remember reading the New Testament and reading the Gospels especially because there it was as though God was speaking directly to me. And you know what? He was. And He still does that because those words are personal. And they changed my life. They changed the direction of my life. They changed what I was going to do with my life. And that is my testimony. It's a small part of it, but it's a huge bit. You see, when God breaks in, He gives each of us a testimony to share. Maybe for you, You've never known a time when you didn't believe in Jesus as your Savior. That's a testimony. Perhaps for you, it's you'd wandered away and God brought you back in a very powerful fashion. But whatever God has done in your life, He has given you a testimony. And that testimony is powerful in many ways. One obvious way, when we share our testimony, Individuals who may not agree with our understanding of God and the Scriptures can't argue with the fact that it's changed our lives. And hearing that testimony can very frequently speak to them in ways that will rattle their cages until God finally opens them. Yeah. That's one way a testimony works, but there's another way. Our testimonies strengthen us. The testimony God has given you is a means by which He desires to strengthen you. It's one of the reasons why I regularly remind myself of what God has done in my life. Remind myself of how He has moved and touched my heart, revealed Himself through His Word, how that has impacted me over the years from the time I was a child until now. And that's been a long time. It's getting longer all the time. <laughs> but by rehearsing that testimony, there is strength. There is the realization, especially in difficult times, that God has been faithful all along. That not only does His Word proclaim that, but He has demonstrated that in my life. And by telling myself that testimony, it encourages and strengthens me. Not only that, it keeps that testimony sharp. And it reminds me that God provides interesting opportunities where we can share our testimony with someone who asks. It is His tool, His instrument for reaching others with the message of Jesus. Peter says, always be prepared. In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Remember your testimony. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, we read these words. They triumphed over him, meaning the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The testimony God gives is powerful. And it's something that you and I are blessed by as we rehearse it in our own minds and share it when God gives the opportunity leads us to the next question, and that's the where question. Where is your strength? Maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, oh, you know, I just, I, I get, I get tongue-tied and nervous. Um, I think all of us do. Nervous, definitely. Tongue-tied sometimes. But then we have to ask the question, where is our strength? You know, if my strength is in myself, then you know, that's going to be pretty up and down. <laughs> and uh, if my strength is in my own abilities, 
then I'm going to have some pretty bad days. But that's not where my strength is found, and it's not where your strength is found. Where is our strength found? God is our refuge and strength, the Bible declares, a very present help in times of trouble. Jesus said he will give us what is necessary to bear witness to him. In fact, it's really fascinating. If you look in the Gospel of Luke, there are two very interesting passages where Jesus speaks about the strength to give our testimony, to bear witness to him. In the one occasion, Jesus says he will give us the strength, the words to speak. In the other, he says the Holy Spirit will give us the words to speak. And the answer is that God always works in perfect harmony. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He is our strength. Listen to these words, from, first of all, from the Gospel of Luke chapter 21. This is Luke 21, verse 15. Jesus says, For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to contradict. Jesus says that. That's a promise. I don't know about you. I'm going to hang on to that one. I'm going to hang on to that because no matter what comes, I know that my Lord Jesus is so remarkably and incredibly powerful that he will not fail me and he will give me what I need. That's where my strength comes from. But listen also to these words from Luke chapter 12. Easy to remember these two sections, by the way. Luke 21 and Luke 12. Just reverse the numbers, okay? Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Jesus says, When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Where is our strength found? It is found in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And therefore, I do not need to be afraid. You do not need to be afraid because God is our refuge and strength. And therefore, we can always be prepared. Which leads us then to the final question here this morning. How do you answer? How do you answer? If someone asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, how do you answer? And the answer is kindly, with gentleness and respect. Because you see, you and I will never be able to argue someone into the kingdom of God not by our own abilities, not by our own strength, even if you can marshal the most amazing arguments, all you are going to do in most cases is simply make an enemy who will seek to disprove you. We are called to speak the truth in love. That's what the scripture tells us in the book of Ephesians. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, even our Lord Jesus Christ. We speak truthfully. We speak lovingly with gentleness and respect. And the reason for that is profound. First of all, we speak that way because we know our own weakness. You see, neither you nor I deserve what God has given us. And we do not look at others who do not believe or do not trust Him and say, oh, what miserable people they are. We say, but for God's grace, that's where I would be. And as a result, I am simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find the bread of life. And so we are called to speak with gentleness and respect, speaking the truth in love, but having in our heart, having in our heart the desire that all people come to know the living God. He is a God who loves the world. And he says he wants them all. And he has empowered you and me 
by the circle of influence in our lives to share with others the mighty things He has done. Always be prepared, the Scripture says, to give an answer. And that means, it means realizing where my hope comes from. It means yielding myself each day to the Lord Jesus. It means remembering what God has done in my life and rehearsing it over and again. It means relying upon Him. And it means coming before others with humility, with kindness, with gentleness, but also with a sure testimony of the goodness of the living God. That's preparedness. That is spiritual preparedness. And that changes lives, beginning with us. Let's take a moment for prayer now. And let's pray through those questions. We're going to pray silently, but I'd like to start each one of those prayers as each of us come before God. And so first of all, why are you hopeful? Where is your hope found? Is it found in the Lord Jesus? And if not, God is calling you today to yield yourself to Him. And to say, Lord, I, I've tried to do this on my own and it's not working. And I believe you died for me and you rose for me. And if you're doing that for the first time, or just simply stating once again what you believe with all your heart, let's come before God and do just that. Who is your Lord? Have you yielded your life to the Lord Jesus? If not, now is the time to say, Lord, today I give my heart to you. If he is your Lord, now is the time to say, Lord, I re-up. What is your testimony? My dear friends, may I just suggest that today you either share that testimony with another, perhaps someone in your own home, or merely talk to God about it, but reflect on that testimony, what He has done in your life, and thank Him for it. Lord, I thank You that You have given us a testimony. Where is your strength found? God, you are our refuge and strength. How do you answer? Lord, may we speak the truth in love today tomorrow, always, until you return. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 God bless you, my dear friends, in these coming days. As you are prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope that you have in you. And may God bless you in a mighty way as we live for Him.